I'm Elizabeth Weber, and I'm the director of the Kellogg Writer Series. And before I introduce Zach Lee, who's going to introduce tonight's first reader, Michael Meyerhofer, I want to take a moment to thank a few people. Provost Deb Baylong and Dean Jen Drake for funding. All the English department faculty, um, if it weren't for these people, contributions for the reading would not have happened. I also want to thank for all their help, Jenny Randall and Christy Beckman in, in events uh, services and bookstore manager Kim Million and the members of her staff who are out there selling books. And I also want to thank the students in my Lit Art programming course and they're sitting right there, Tierney Bailey, Rachel Nuetti, and also Myrna Lasio. And last but not least, I, I want to thank the English Department and Ministry of Assistant Debbie McGarry, who's, without whose help, I think, frankly, I would go insane. So um, you can find out more about the Kellogg Writers Series on the University of Indianapolis's Hey, uh, arts page, which is called You Indie Arts. Kellogg Writer Series also has a Facebook page. It's underneath Kellogg Writer Series if you want to know more. Um, on March 16th, we're going to have a, a poet Teresa Maychuk reading. And then on April 1st, we're going to have poet and former You Indie faculty member Alice Fryman reading. I want to tell you a little bit about, um, about the Whirling Prize. Both Michael and Teresa won the Whirling Prize for this year. The Whirling Prize is an annual award that's given to works that are chosen by the U Indy students. And each year, a, 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 is a, they have a different theme for the books. Okay, a different theme or a different genre. This year's theme or genre was uh, fantasy writing, science fiction or magical realism, okay? And as far as whether it's fiction, nonfiction, I don't know if you could have fantasy nonfiction, but there you are, <laughs> or poetry, okay? Um, and then next year, I've been told that it's either going to be, the theme is either popular culture or else coming of age. And again, uh, that's very open as to, as to the genre. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, you can go to the U Indy English Department's website for, I don't know if the present for the rules for next year are up there yet, but um, you can see what they were for last year. Um, after Michael Meyerhofer finishes reading, Tierney Bailey will come up and introduce Teresa Milbrode. After both Teresa and Michael read. There will be a short question and answer, answer um, <coughs> section. And then also I want to remind you that both their books are available outside in the hall. Um, and with this, I'm going to call up Zach Lee, and he is going to introduce Michael. So I was one of the students who was on the Whirling Prize Committee, and um, it was a great honor to do that. So, um, Witch Fire was always a strong candidate to win the Whirling Prize, and I'm glad it did. The novel doesn't mess around. It grabs the reader right off the bat and keeps them entertained throughout the story. There wasn't a single spot where I was pulled out or questioned what was going on. It was a lot of fun to read from start to finish. The second book in the Dragon King trilogy, Night's Wrath, is coming out through Red Dead Publishing. On top of writing fantasy novels, Meyerhofer is an accomplished poet with a new poetry collection, What to Do If You're Buried Alive, coming out through Split Lit Press. His third book, pardon me if I butcher it, uh, Damatio Memoriae, won the Brick Road Poetry Book Contest. His previous books are Leaving Iowa and Blue Collar Eulogies. He has published five chapbooks and has won the Marjorie J. Wilson Best Poem Contest, the Laureate Prize for Poetry, the James Wright Poetry Award, and the Annie Finch Prize for Poetry. His work has appeared in Plowshares, North American Review, Arts and Others, River Sticks, Quick Fiction, Asimov, Science Fiction Magazine, and other journals. Welcome, Michael Meyerhofer. <laughs> Everybody's so pretty. I'm gonna take a picture of you. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna 
to take two pictures. For the first one, try and look as grumpy as you possibly can. Really angry, you don't want to be here, this is stupid, writing is dumb. Okay, now look really, really happy. Yay, my author, please start here, we're so awesome, we love you so much. That was pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Zach, for that awesome introduction. Um, thanks, everybody, for having us. It's good to meet you. Thanks, Mira and Tierney, for having not only awesome names, but getting me from the airport in one piece. <laughs> and I thought I would uh, just read a section of the first chapter of my book, Witchfire. Um, it's, the book is basically about a guy who wants to become a knight because he has like his boyhood. Uh, almost like childlike belief that this is this honorable, wonderful world, and then he quickly discovers that everything is absolutely not that way at all. Uh, and so throughout the book, basically everything goes horribly, horribly wrong, but in a good way, so. <laughs> Chapter one. My name's Dagath, the robber grinned. Rowan blinked away the blood dripping down half his face and met the robber's gaze. The wound was still too fresh to hurt, but his senses reeled. The robber towered over him, a big man with rotten teeth. He wore mismatched leather armor that he'd probably taken off previous victims, most of which looked too small and also cracked from poor upkeep. The buckles rusted through. Most striking was the fact that the robber was missing an eye, but had not even bothered to cover the scarred socket with a patch. Dagoth paused, clearly amused by the look on Rowan's face. Men ought to know the name of the man who's going to kill them. I'd ask yours, but I really don't give a damn. He gave his cudgel a few menacing practice swings. You ready to go with the gods, boy? Rowan had struggled back onto his feet, but could do a little more. The blow to his head had caught him completely by surprise, stunning him long enough for a second smaller robber to bind Rowan's hands behind his back. Rowan might have fought with his feet, on the Lotus Isles, he'd been taught to kick as well as punch, but it took all his willpower just to hold on to consciousness. Breaking Daggett's gaze, Rowan looked around and spotted his short sword lying nearby, a plain but elegant weapon with a wasted, avarian style blade all Rowan had from his old life. Daggett scooped it up and whistled. Not bad. Probably sell for a nice price in one of those cities. Me, I prefer a good club. Daggett stabbed the short sword into the earth and stepped so close that Rowan could smell the stink of the man's breath, like rotten meat bathed in sour milk. Rowan's eyes fell on his attacker's cudgel again. But the robber did not strike, clearly content to enjoy the moment. He jabbed the tip of his cudgel into Rowan's chin and pushed his head to eye level. What, no clever last words, no bribes? He looked past Rowan at the second robber, still standing behind him. This is a first. Whatever coins I've got, I imagine I'll get them soon enough, Rowan said, seething. You've already got my sword. Besides that, all I've got left is in my pack. I have a look. Rowan nodded towards his satchel, which he dropped the moment he saw the small man lying on the road, fainting, injury. Rowan had seen that trick before. A robber called for help, waited until some hapless traveler got close, then stuck a knife in his throat and took what he wanted. Rowan had been ready for that, but in his overconfidence, he had not seen Daggett sneaking up behind him. Daggett turned, reflexively eyeing the pack. Gathering what strength he had left, Rowan pitched forward and drove his knee toward the robber's groin. With a look of only mild surprise, Daggett twisted and took the blow on his hip instead. Then he swung his cudgel onto Rowan's knee. Rowan bit, bit his lip to keep from screaming and fell back down. He wondered if he would lose consciousness after all. It might be better that way. But then he cursed and fought back the darkness, nipping at his vision. Daggett upended the satchel onto the ground. Small man, confident that Rowan was going nowhere, hurried forward to inspect the goods. Both looked disappointed. Aside from a few articles of clothing, the satchel contained little more than a whetstone, sword oil, a nearly empty water skin, a rolled up scrap of parchment his coin pouch, and two books. Daggett snatched up the coin pouch, yanked it open, and shook out its contents. It gave Rowan a withering look when only three copper coins tumbled out. This it, boy? He threw them on the ground and used his cudgel to poke through the rest of Rowan's possessions. 
small man retrieved the coins and inspected them. I think these are idle coins, he said quietly, holding one in the afternoon light and inspecting the seal. Looks like some kind of bird balancing on one foot. Crane, Rowan thought, but kept silent. He had managed to roll onto his side to keep his weight off his knee. His instincts had saved him, allowing him to pivot at the last second. He did not think Dagus' blow had smashed his kneecap, though the pain was making his eyes water. Dagus frowned and snatched the coin from small man's grasp, inspecting it for himself. You don't have to be an aisle man to have aisle coins, you dunce. They use them all over these days. He started to discard the copper coin and change his mind to pocket it instead. Or maybe he's an aisle knight, small man offered. Might be one giant ransom if he is. Dagoth gave his accomplice so cold to look at for a moment, Rowan wondered if a small man's suggestion would be answered by Dagoth's cudgel. Dagoth pointed, does that look like an aisle knight to you? Before small man could answer, Dagoth returned to where Rowan was still lying in pain. He prodded him with his cudgel. Well, speak up, boy, you a knight? Rowan's face turned almost the same color as the blood drying around his gashed forehead. Well, no knight. Never even been to the aisles. Shame surged through him, but he masked it with anger. Get on with it. Either kill me or let me go, you bastard. But Dagus' good eyes sparkled. You're lying. He went back to Rowan's goods and retrieved one of the books. He opened one, then laughed coldly. I can't read, but I know Lotus Isle scribbles when I see them. He threw the book to his accomplice. You're too grubby to be a knight. You're too pale to be a native Isle man. You know what I think? Rowan started to close his eyes, then stopped himself, trying to meet Dagus' gaze without emotion. He offered no reply. Nevertheless, Dagus laughed. He turned to his accomplice, know what we have here, Sneed? Another exile. He flashed Rowan another toothy, rotten grin. Sneed nodded, but Dagus explained anyway. Just to taunt me, and God knows I deserve it. You see, once in a while, some dumb bastard gets in his head to sail off to the Lotus Isles to be at night. Well, they don't take kindly to mainlanders, so if you want to train, you have to pay a lot. Dagoth pretended to be lost in thought. I bet this one was a sellsword, probably spent years saving up the coin. He laughed again. They took his money. Then once they were tired of him, they kicked him out. He grabbed a handful of Rowan's unruly red hair, jerking up so Rowan was looking at him. Am I right? Rowan said nothing. Daggett chuckled and returned to Sneed, who had retrieved the second book as well as busy leafing through them. What are they? Daggett asked him. Can't read more than a few words, but this one looks like a whole big list of rules. Sneed handed the thicker volume back to Daggett, who merely glanced at it and tossed it aside. This other one looks like poetry. He opened a page and held it up. Pretty pictures, too. Colored ink. There's a handsome one here of a dragon somewhere. He started leafing through the pages again. They worth anything? Probably some priest in Lyos would buy them. Some rich ambassador from the Isles, if we can find one. Sneed paused to think it over. I bet each one's worth at least as much as that sword of his. Rowan recalled how on the Isles illustrated copies of the Codex Lodius could be bought for almost any street vendor for a few copper coins. As for the Codex Viticus, that arduous tome he had been forced, that had been forced on him almost as soon as he arrived at Cicado Temple, Rowan could be glad to be rid of it. I survived, that is. At the mention of Rowan's sword, Dagoth had gone and retrieved it with his free hand. By then the failed squire had sat up straining vainly against his bonds. Don't bother. Sneed's not worth much, but at least he can tie a decent knot. Dagus smiled with almost genuine. Almost feel like I should thank you, boy. Any last words? Maybe a plea to the dragon god? Rowan had already tried to stand and failed, but he knew he had to try again. His mind scrambled for some kind of diversion. Then an idea formed. Though it was ludicrous, he had no choice. My father's a blacksmith in Harso, not far from here, he lied. He's not rich, but he's got a few coins to rub together. He was the one who paid for my training. God's know what he'll say when he finds out I got kicked out. Rowan forced to smile. Anyway, if it's ransom you're after, take me there. Dagus scowled, clearly trying to decide if his captive was telling the truth. 
Thanks to years of training on the aisles, Rowan had the arms of a blacksmith, though everything else about him, unkept hair, plain clothes, the fact he was traveling alone, more closely resembled a sellsword. Dagoth glanced around, studying Rowan's short sword again, though unadorned, the cross guard was brass, the blade high quality. Caton gave me that. The thought of his dead brother made Rowan wince, but he hoped Dagoth mistook his grief for fear. He could be telling the truth, Snead offered. Or he could be stalling, hoping to get away, or wait us out until somebody comes along to rescue him. Dagoth lifted the hand holding Rowan's short sword, and he used one dirty thumbnail to scratch at his scarred eye socket. That it, boy? You think some armored knight's going to thunder in and save you? No. Rowan knew as well that his captors, knew as well as his captors, that they were too far from the coast, where they might be chanced upon by patrol of Isle Knights. Bios was still the closest to the free cities, but wanted to be left alone, Rowan had chosen to travel via, via the most deserted road, a decision he now deeply regretted. <clears throat> Dagoth looked down at Rowan's short sword again, then glanced back at the books, visibly weighing the odds, trying to decide if he should be content with his already impressive haul, or push his luck. This one's cruel, not stupid, Rowan realized. He knows if he takes a ransom note to a town, whether I'm lying or not. He might wind up dead. Refuge sticks with what he already has. But greed won out. Fine, we'll try it your way. If we're telling the truth, maybe you'll even have to, you will have to keep the gods waiting a while. Daggett lowered his weapons. Sneed can write some, but it's best to know it's in your scribbles. You know letters? I can write. Daggett smirked. Figures. I don't want to tear up them books. Sneed, I saw parchment there. Bring it. Rowan restrained a curse when he realized the scrap of parchment that Daggett was referring to. He wanted to argue, but thought better of it. Sneed brought the scrap. He gave Rowan a faint, nearly reassuring smile as he handed the ancient-looking parchment to Daggett. This one's different. He's a robber, sure, but not quite a cutthroat. Daggett kicked his injured knee to catch his attention. Rowan swore. Scribble your father, tell him he pays 20 silvers, or else I'll have to bury you in pieces. Rowan knew better than to accept too quickly. Twenty is a lot. I told you he's poor, and I'm pretty. What of it? Every town needs a blacksmith. The villagers can pass around a goddamn collection bowl if they need to. How will you get the letter to him? Daggett shrugged. Sneed can take it. Rowan saw his chance. Then Sneed will bring the coin back himself. Daggett's expression changed. Rowan smiled with a smile. You don't think of that, you bastard. Sneed faced Daggett. You can trust me. Fools hells I can. Daggett interrupted with a snort. Rowan could imagine what he was thinking. If Sneed did not deliver the letter, then Daggett would have to do it. That would mean leaving him in Sneed's care. He guessed Daggett had reached the same conclusion. I'll take it myself. Town's not far. He turned to Sneed. God's hear me. If he's not here when I get back, I'll cut out your spine and keep your share. Sneed's face paled. He tried to respond, but stammered. Daggett threw the parchment at Rowan's feet. He waved to Sneed again. I tie his hands so he can write, but bind up his feet. He prodded Rowan with his own sword. Guess I don't have to tell you what happens if you try anything cute. Rowan shook his head. Sneed bound Rowan's feet with a length of rope that Rowan had been using as a belt, Sneed's trembling hands fussed with a bond, securing his wrists. When the bonds went slack, Rowan resisted the impulse to throw an elbow at Sneed's jaw. He wouldn't get far with his legs still tied anyway. He massaged his sore wrist and gingerly touched the gash on his forehead. Sneed withdrew. Daggett pointed at the parchment. Right. Daggett hesitated. I'm the poor but familiar handwriting already covering one whole side of the parchment. No ink. Daggett frowned. Rowan said, if you start a fire, I can use ash, maybe. You think I'm stupid, boy? Ash doesn't last. Daggett sneered. Best we use blood. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
Teresa after a creative writing class that I snuck into but didn't really sneak into where she was gracious enough to spend her time writing with us and sharing some of her own creative processes. And then I met her again about an hour later <laughs> at a Chinese buffet with a friend while stuffing my face. I hope, I really hope that the food passed on whatever food rating system you apply. Um, and I hope you didn't eat until you were so full you hated yourself, because that's kind of the worst. But, back to business. Teresa Milbrook received her MFA in Creative Writing and her MA in American Culture Studies from Bowling Green University. In addition to her flash fiction collection, collection Larissa Takes Flight Stories, which is really good and you should all go buy it right out there. Um, she is the author of a short story collection, Bearded Women's Stories, and a novel, The Patron Saint of Unattractive People. Milbro has published widely in literary journals, including North American Review, Crazy Horse, Indiana Review, and Nimrod. She lives in Gunnison, Colorado, with her husband Tristan and her cat Aspen, and teaches online fiction and creative nonfiction classes through Denver based Lighthouse Writers Workshop. First question, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, awesome. I hate podiums. Although they are very good for holding bottles of water. So I will use it to do that. Okay. So um, this is a collection of flash fiction, all told from the point of view of my protagonist and alter ego, Larissa, and the uh, little lemon on the co uh, cover there. Uh, she has a lemon drop halo that she uh, always wears. This begins pretty early on in the collection, so uh, when halos are referenced, that's, that's why. And thank you so much to all of the students who are in the class for selecting this book. I feel just honored to be here. Thank you so much for to Elizabeth for having the patience with me in setting up my schedule, and thank you to Elizabeth and all the students for, for shuffling me around from place to place, and thank you to Brian Farunas, my editor for this book, who gave me the best advice ever to weird it up, and he did and did not know what he was asking. So <laughs> here we go. <clears throat> Larissa communes with the Virgin again. Because I can tell it's going to be a crappy day at work, I dress up as the Virgin Mary in my blue silk dress and white head scarf and latest lemon drop halo that got coffee spilled on it, so it's a little warped, but it will do for one day of selling shoes. I know people will want to yell at me today, my boss, my coworkers, my whiny customers, but it's hard to yell at the Virgin Mary. When I walk inside the store, I'm greeted with new shoe incense, intoxicating and chemical, a smell that makes people whip out their wallets. On the walls are pictures of shoes like Russian icons, stilettos and tennis shoes and running shoes and penny loafers and slippers and knee-high boots that lace all the way up. My boss has the morning news on on the radio, and the announcer says bombing, 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 bombing like some Gregorian chant as I walk to the break room and smell coffee and donuts from the assistant manager who's sweet and plump and looks like everyone's aunt. I check my hair, grab a cinnamon sugar donut, and eat leaning forward so I don't get anything on my dress. I have to be pristine when I am Mary, though Mary didn't care about being pristine because she had a kid in a barn. I finish my donut and walk back to the showroom and wait for customers to ask me questions, but the few who wander in from the morning street look at me and keep quiet like they think the virgin is above shoes. But wouldn't she want people to have comfortable footwear? When you're wearing a bad pair of sandals with no arch support, your whole life can go to hell pretty quick, and I know she would understand that. My coworker Melinda says, what the hell is that yellow thing behind your head? I say, it's a halo. My boss says, this is not a Christmas pageant. But an older lady walks in and grabs my hand and starts weeping about her grandson who's in high school and getting involved in drugs, and she doesn't know what to do. 
So I pat her arm and show her a nice pair of black flats and say that every step will feel like a foot massage and her grandson probably needs counseling. And yes, she tried asking for help at the family center down the street because it's free. She buys the black flats and thanks me and I straighten my halo, which may not be all that wrinkled after all. My boss shuts up about my costume because she couldn't give a shit as long as we're making sales. <laughs> I sell patent leather Mary Janes and woven sandals made in Yemen and snakeskin boots and offer calm advice about how to deal with misbehaving kids and cheating spouses and parents whose memories are slipping. Too few people will admit they need advice, and too many buy shoes whether they need them or not, so that combining the two seems like a logical balance. I like your halo, says my assistant manager when she comes in with another box of donuts. Melinda whispers that the assistant manager needs to go to Weight Watchers, but she couldn't say anything nice to a basket of kittens. During the afternoon, I wonder if I should go back to school for a psychology degree. My mother says psychologists are people with common sense and letters after their names, who tell you things you already know but need to hear from a professional. The customers who look at me like I'm crazy go to Melinda for help, but in the afternoon someone leaves a lit votive candle by the cash register, and the assistant manager smiles, but my boss says this is getting weird. My shift is over, so I walk back to my apartment in costume. The halo got slobbered on by a grabby two-year-old, so I need to make a new one tonight, but this one still does the job. At every intersection, the light changes to green just as my shoes hit the curb. The sign flashes white. Walk. It says, walk. So I do. <laughs> yeah, before the reading, we were talking about who was going to go first. And Elizabeth suggested that perhaps Michael should go first. And then I was like listening to your reading. I was like, ending with lighting something in blood. <laughs> we weren't sure if we wanted to send you home with that note. And so. <laughs> So we're sending you home with Larissa and Larissa in space. I watch this bad sci-fi movie with my philosopher boyfriend who complains because the movie aliens have arms and legs. And if they're real aliens, they're not going to look like we think aliens will look like, which is mostly like humans but not. Real aliens might appear to be hot air balloons or squid or something we don't even have a name for. I lean forward on the couch and say, so aliens could be here and we don't even know it? He shrugs and says, why not? I say, because that would freak me out. He says it's in the papers all the time, how people think they were abducted by aliens, pale beings with hollow eyes, but that's how you know they're making it up. I'd be more likely to believe someone if she said she was abducted by aliens that looked like fuzzy purple caterpillars, he says, something I wouldn't expect. My boyfriends think aliens will find us after we're gone, and they'll have to make sense of our gardens of concrete and rusted metal and empty pop bottles to coat our lives through plastic. The next day, I have lunch with my coworker Melinda, and when she tells me for the 20th time about her boyfriend's new dog, a petty breed beagle, I look at her calmly and say, I was abducted by aliens last night. Then I keep chewing my peanut butter and banana and honey sandwich. She stops eating. What? She says. I say, I was abducted by aliens last night, and look into my sandwich to see how many banana slices remain. You were not, she says. They looked like caterpillars, I say. Fuzzy purple caterpillars. She crunches her empty chip bag in one hand. That's not how aliens look, she says. I smile and say, how many times have you been abducted? <laughs> her shoulders get stiff. She says, I just know that's not how aliens look. I say, I was lying in bed and I couldn't move and I saw these little purple caterpillars crawling all over my body like they were inspecting me and then there was a bright light and we were in this thing that must have been their spaceship but I couldn't see much and there were more caterpillars all over me and it was soft and gentle like being inspected by cotton balls and I know they just wanted to figure out more about humans so I didn't move or try to squish them. <laughs> it's working or at least Melinda shut up about the damn beagle so I go on. After 10 minutes, there was another bright light and I was back in bed. Just a dream, she says. No, I say, shaking my head. It was very real. <laughs> you should see someone, she says, looking away from me. I say, I'm talking to a reporter tonight. Don't make a fool of yourself, she says. 
The world needs to hear this, I say. People need to know we have been visited. By then, lunch is over, so there can be no more talk of beagles or how much they cost or how many times they need to go outside to pee every day. And I hear Melinda yap at our boss and use white hand gestures and glance at me and say, caterpillars. <laughs> I smile and wave because work is going better than before. We have a new assistant manager who brings in donuts every morning and made me employee of the month last month, and Melinda's just jealous. But on the drive home, I hear about a cult in Idaho whose members say they were dropped off on Earth by aliens 20 years ago, and the aliens will come back to pick them up soon. And every time in the Bible when the angels are mentioned, they really mean aliens. Big glowing figures with wings, it's perfectly logical. I start to roll my eyes, but stop, because I can't really make fun of alien stories now. Maybe we all want to be abducted, singled out as special by something from the great beyond. I turn, on the ra I turn the radio down and keep driving. Imagine that little purple caterpillar ringing my wrist like a fuzzy bracelet, listening to me talk about my job at the shoe store as it writes its book on the species. <laughs> Okay, and since I was with um, the fiction writing of folk yesterday, and some of them were in the class that selected uh, our books, I was able to take a couple of requests. So uh, I will read a couple of those, and so the first one, Larissa and the Closet Monster. I find the purple monster in my closet while I'm looking for old Christmas decorations. The monster gasps when it sees me and starts crying, begging me to let it stay. You never come in here during the daytime, it whimpers. I don't know where else to go. I'm more surprised than scared to see the monster. I stopped being scared of it years ago when I hit junior high and there were many other things to frighten me. Losing weight, getting a boyfriend, keeping my grades up, getting a college scholarship, never managed that one, getting out of my parents' house and finding a job. The monster blubbers for several more minutes, so I find a box of tissues and dig le my lemon drop halo out of the bottom dresser drawer so it can see I'm a good person and not someone who's going to kick a monster out into the cruel streets. Even though I wasn't looking for him, I assure the monster that I'm glad we finally met. Once it stops crying, the monster explains it's been in my closet for several years after it migrated from under my bed. It's always been worried about discovery and worried it would never be discovered, which makes me think of my last five boyfriends and how, in the end, I wish they would have never found me. <laughs> Could you please be scared of me again, it says, dabbing the damp purple fur around its eyes and smiling hopefully with huge yellowed teeth. Probably not, I say, adjusting my halo. But two days ago, I found out that my latest boyfriend had been cheating on me, and I don't want to eat supper alone. So I invite the monster to dinner, pizza and ice cream, because I need to bitch about how there are no decent men in the world, or at least how I haven't, how I haven't found them. The monster is happy to listen. We become fast friends and share a lot of gripes and cooking tips. I even bring home sushi as a treat because the monster really likes California rolls, and it seems a little depressed. It had still been hoping to scare me someday. That's the only thing I can assume because it was hiding out in my closet. But that ambition is fading fast, and not having a goal in life really stinks, especially if you're a monster. I find out my monster has an impressive vocabulary because he's read my Oxford English Dictionary several times. <laughs> there wasn't much else to do under my bed while plotting how to scare me. I suggest the monster start writing its memoirs while I'm at work. I haven't read any books by monsters, and I'm pretty sure it could be a bestseller. It's even better that my monster sounds like it went to, went to Yale. My monster writes chapters on how to frighten people in ten languages, the joys of Lindcraft, and how it amused itself by memorizing the first million decimal places of pi. Being a monster means you have a lot of downtime to devote to intellectual improvement. My monster is waiting for me when I come home from the shoe store, and I like having company. The lease agreement said no pets, but it didn't say anything about monsters. It's perfectly happy to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, dry cereal, and cheap microwave pizzas. Previously, it had subsisted on dust bunnies and weak old nightmares. So keeping it around isn't very expensive. It even does the dishes and vacuums my apartment while I'm at work. I'm a little embarrassed that my monster is better at housekeeping than I am, but I can never find it in myself to keep things tidy. My inner clean freak hides too well. 
The monster says not to worry, then straightens my halo. The monster continues living in my closet, even though I said it could sleep on the couch. It prefers small, enclosed spaces. I tell my monster it can use my art supplies while I'm at work, because last year I decided that I wanted to be a pastel artist, and that lasted all of two weeks. My monster draws while hunched over at the kitchen table. It's especially good with flowers, depicting dark and lovely gardens that I magnet to the fridge. On the weekend, we watch movies, foreign language or art house films, and eat popcorn. My monster teaches me German. It's trilingual and loves Mandarin, too, but says one language at a time is enough. When my monster starts looking for an agent for his memoir, all we get are kind rejections that suggest the publishing industry thinks we are crazy. But they tell us that we hope our unique project will find a home. This is when I open the literary agency out of my kitchen and start emailing publishing companies promoting my monster's book. My monster mopes, eats pizza, and says it's a lost cause. I grimace and send out another email blast. My friend Rob at the convenience store, um, the convenience store designs a website for my agency, and I pay him in cookies. I make up foreign clients and book titles, explaining that this new author is a best-selling writer in China. I figure enough lying, lying will make somebody believe me. At last, we get a response from a little art house publishing company in Chicago that loves my monster's drawings, thinks they're reminiscent of Magritte, and compares its writing to Confucian philosophy. <laughs> We're so happy to have discovered this fresh new voice, they say. Whatever, I say, because I'm the one who found the monster to begin with. But when the contract arrives, my monster does a happy dance in the kitchen, and we order out for sushi even though we're not getting any advanced. We're, we're amazed that it worked. My monster gives me a fur, furry cheek kisses and asks if it can live in my closet forever. Because we're on the verge of our, uh, of our 14 and a half minutes of fame and my apartment has never been so clean, I say sure, why not? We watch another art house film in a language I don't understand, and I wonder who may be looking for me, whether they know it or not. Just enough time before we will end with uh, two of the shorter ones in the collection. Starting with Larissa Meets Bigfoot. <laughs> who I'm pretty sure lives in the thicket behind my apartment, because if you're Bigfoot, it's where you'd go to avoid the photographers and biographers and economic crisis, because everyone is trying to make a buck, and you could end up on the cover of National Enquirer again, and on a dissecting table in the same week. When you're Bigfoot, you can't have any real friends. You don't know who might turn you into the FBI or CIA or NRA and use you for target practice. You're huge. You're vulnerable. You might as well stop hiding in the forest where everyone expects you to leave footprints and get a job that's good and solitary, like driving a truck across the Arctic Circle so you can wear a parka and snow pants and just your eyes will show through the ski mask. But no one will care because at the depot, they'll load your rig with corn chips and tires and send you off across the ice field. And in the cab, you can put on the radio and croon to some old country song because they're sappy and about loss. And when you're Bigfoot, you have a lot to lose. So during your vacations, you can put on jeans and an extra large flannel shirt and a cowboy hat and go to Nashville to the Grand Old Opry, where half of the singers are, are as hairy as you. And you can sit in the back row and weep because that's how it is, man. You lose your dog and your woman and your truck, and it's enough to make you hole up in some cabin and invent theories on why people won't you leave you alone. It's a big conspiracy. And who cares if you exist because you know you do, and that's all that matters. But I know Bigfoot exists, and he's in my backyard, and I'm not telling anyone. Just leaving a package of pre-cooked hot dogs and some buns and potato chips and cream-filled sandwich cookies on the fire escape, and if they're gone in the morning, it could be the neighbor kids. But really, it's Bigfoot, living in my thicket, listening to Johnny Cash on the radio, and waiting for good times to come around again. <laughs> Okay, and then my personal favorite, Larissa and Barbie. Oh, we're talking about Barbies and like decapitating them at, at uh, dinner, so this is like totally fanatic. Um, okay. 
I never asked for one when I was a kid, but my friends gave them to me at birthday parties because their mothers thought Barbie was what every little girl should want. But dressing those plastic arms was a pain because of spaghetti-thin straps and skirts so tiny they got lost or chewed up by the cat. And I found millions of things that were more fun to do with Barbie than stuff her plastic arm and do another prom dress, like give the Mobies, Mar Barbies mohawks with blunt scissors or draw mustaches and facial hair and tattoos on their plastic skin with a ballpoint pen because Barbie with a skull in her naked chest was a lot more interesting. And before long, I had my own Barbie freak show with the bearded lady Barbie and the tattooed woman Barbie and the fire-eating Barbie that didn't work so well because the match burned her lips and hair, but then she became <laughs> Elephant Man Barbie. All of them starring in a show I staged on a shoebox were my Barbie's mind performances with her twisted and too thin limbs, and I tried to get the neighborhood kids to see a spectacle by setting it up in the backyard and charging a dime for a ticket and a cup of lemonade, and I don't know what calls my mom got after that, but she said I shouldn't do it again. And I heard her ask my dad if I should see the school counselor, but even then I knew Barbie was the one who needed help, with her schizophrenic career path and inability to do anything without wearing heels. I saved her from that boxed-in fate. She needed new horizons. To get that uncombable hair messed up and fight the real fights in a glass ceiling world where women get 80 cents when men get a dollar. Even then I knew, it, even then I knew we needed liberation bra burning by curious ultra hip Barbie who could transform her feet and waist and hips and boobs into something realistic. A Barbie who could narrow those blue eyes into fighting slits and be a plastic babe who meant business. Like grassroots organization protester Barbie picketing the Capitol and getting arrested and calling Ken to pay bail. <laughs> rejection emails, delete them immediately, and then send the stuff out. <laughs> all Do that, yours, yeah. yeah. All of that, and then add drink heavily, depending on, <laughs> depending on your age. Depending on your age, you're not advocating. See, see, I'm weird. I don't drink, like, alcohol. I, like, my drug of choice is caffeine, so, um... Yeah, more than one. Um... <laughs> uh, do some chocolate. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Have you ever considered acting? Yes. <laughs> well, I think um, a lot of poets have, and um, a lot of poets have a performative flair. And when I started writing Larissa stories, I was hanging out with a bunch of performance poets, and like I'm primarily a fiction writer, and so I was just like, dude, I don't have anything to read. Like, what am I supposed to do? And um, tone and voice had always been a strong part of my longer stories. And so I was like, I just, I need some performative fiction. And so that's where Larissa was born. So, yeah. Do you think your story will ever become a movie? That would be so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I have no, no doubt about this at all. <laughs> I'm not lying. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Your performative, your performing voice fits the character really well. Thank you. Um, it says on your book that you live with your wife and too many cats. How many kitties? Four. I had two, and she had two, and then now we have four, and they don't all like each other. Oh, <laughs> dude, that was going to be my next question. A couple of them are bastards, too. Like, one of them is what I like to call incontinent. And, uh, it's, yeah. There's, there's, it sucks. <laughs> don't, don't have four cats is what I'm trying to say. Was that, was that the one you forgot? Was what? Was that the one you oh, forgot? Oh, that was one of them. Yeah. Yeah, we, were, we, were, we moved here. Uh, we moved to California. 
and uh, it was like a three days in the van with four cats. <laughs> uh, the first it's, night. Is that should that be like one of Dante's levels of hell? It really is. Really sure. <laughs> we like read, we fled from the cops at one point, um, and we couldn't find what. It actually happened a few times. Did you it's, consider throwing one of the cats at the cops? We really, uh, if we could agree on which cat to throw. <laughs> <laughs> Like, we got like a sl good. slingshot for a cat. Ooh, cat a pult. Yeah. Cat. Hey! That's for anybody who cares, that was my bad pun for the week. Used it here. Badass, okay, yes. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what you do after that. <laughs> yeah. I come up with another bad pun next week, sure. but yeah, I have, I have a few days. I know you have a, a sequel to. Um, which fire? Um, how many sequels do you think that you'll have? Um, I have the trilogy written, oh. and I kind of toyed around with the idea of having another one like 10 years later, or so, arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be seven and a half years later, how about that? Yeah, continue it on, or, or start a new one. I'm thinking about it, yeah. Because uh, I have those three, you know, quote, done. Uh, the second one is coming out this summer. Okay. Uh, we're just waiting on the cover art now. And then the third one is done with like a heavier quote. Uh, and then I'm working on a totally different trilogy that has nothing to do with this one, but I might do a third trilogy later, because I don't have a life. <laughs> 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 like, fantasy. Yes? So when do you think we will have the second one published? This summer, um, we're trying, we're basically, like I said, we're just waiting on the cover right now. It's all done. Uh, they have to do a small amount of like formatting to get it to work in Kindle and everything. But other than that, we're, we're done. Yeah. How did you come up with the title? Uh, the, for the second one? Or this one or that one, whichever one you want to talk about. How I don't remember. I, I should come up with a fake story, but no, I can't think of anything. Um, <laughs> well, because the, like, the, the witch fire, uh, I was playing with the idea of like witches burning, except mm -hmm. flipping that around, mm -hmm. which the witch fire is that weird, like purple, oh, deadly okay. fire that they make. Yeah. Uh, so I, and in the book, one of the ideas I keep playing with because I'm a pretentious asshole, is uh, <laughs> uh, like victims and then uh, like fighting back and then sometimes going too far and like who is actually the good guy and who's the bad guy. Because I, I really don't like stories where there's one good guy and one bad guy very clearly. Yeah. So everybody's very, very all over the place. Yeah, I apologize. I saw your book, but I haven't gotten a chance to read it yet. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the title of the second one then? Nice wrath. Yeah. Which makes sense when you read the first one. <laughs> but I can't tell you anything. Spoilers. Everybody dies. <laughs> Will the third one be out this coming winter? And what is it called? Third one, I think, is going to be called The War of the Lotus. Um, and it's like I said, it's done. It just needs a little bit of like formatting and editing and stuff. Um, I'm not sure because usually when they do this, they release them like one year apart. Because by the time you actually get the cover and format it for Kindle and do all that stuff, it just takes it takes a while. If it were up to me, I'd have it out tomorrow. Because <laughs> yeah, I always hated it when I read a book and then the sequels weren't out yet. But don't worry, I'm not gonna die. I mean, I am. But <laughs> they're already written. It's all I have it in my will. What's good? Everything will be fine. Uh, how many years did Larissa and Witchfire take to write? Born. Larissa was born in January of 2009. And, oh gosh. But then the story is just, I kind of had, would do like a few at a time. And the actual idea of putting them together as a collection didn't emerge for a while and then had to get together the collection and then find the right press for it. So yeah, so it took a while, but you just, when you start a writing project, you're never quite sure yeah. where it's gonna go, if it's, if it's gonna work or not. So yeah, she's, but she's still going, still got new stuff from her. So yeah, she, she's never gonna stop. Yeah, especially with this book, I probably spent like 10 years on it, just because like I would write it and then like, you know, I don't really like this story and I would completely rewrite it and revamp it over and over and over again until I kind of got my, until I got settled and knew what I wanted to do. Then once I did that, the sequels came out a lot faster. Yeah, but that, that first book, because I didn't know about something called outlining, 
Apparently is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that made my life a lot easier once I started doing that. So did it take you 10 years to write all three? Or just or just the, the first one? The first one was, um, I think I, I was talking about this earlier in, in, uh, in Elizabeth's class about what kind of got me started. And basically what got me started with writing was plagiarism. Yeah, I, I would read <laughs> stories that I liked. That I really wish I'd written that and I would like write bad copies. So this made this book, I've been like writing and rewriting like forever, basically, since I was like a dorky 13, 14 year old who grew up into an equally dorky adult. <laughs> Um, this question would be for each of you. Um, if you had to pick two books, uh, one would be the most influential for your own work, and then the second one being just what you enjoy the most, doesn't have to do anything with what you write, what would they be? You have ready answer? I think in terms of, uh, influential in terms of form, Sandra Cisneros, House on Mango Street, um, influential in terms of just sort of wackiness and craziness. Um, that's more general authors like George Saunders, Sherman Alexi, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So yeah, those are some of my good ones. Yeah, all those that she said. Uh, <laughs> probably the one that had the biggest influence on me, and it's kind of cliche for fantasy writers to say this, but uh, George Martin. Because uh, I've read tons of fantasy and kind of had gone back and forth on it, and then when I started reading Song of Ice and Fire, I'm like, oh wow, you can actually do all kinds of really cool stuff with this. And you can make it like super complex. So that had like I, I had a lot of fun reading it, and that had I think a, a, a hopefully a good impact on me. Um, another book I like to read just for fun for poetry is actually um, Velocities by Stephen Dobbins, who's a, a fiction writer, but he writes absolutely hilarious poetry. Like it's some of the funniest, but then like some of the saddest poems ever. And that guy's book for like a dollar on Amazon. Awesome. Do either of you guys like read like hard science fiction, I guess? Um, and if you do, um, which one is your favorite? My husband is the one who does more of the hard sci-fi, but then the way we kind of get around this is, is we've done some co-writing projects together, and so I'll do aspects of character and voice and he it's like the characters are mine but like the plot and the world are his and we both kind of work on the side of things that we like better and so since he's doing more of the plot and, and the world building he can get like he can do whatever he wants as long as I've got some some control of the characters and descriptions and stuff and the voice and so We've, we've done some interesting co-writing projects like that with, with sci-fi, which is not really answering your question. <laughs> I'm not going to answer it either. I got nothing. Um, I think we were, we were talking earlier about there's the, uh, occasionally there's weird tension between sci-fi and fantasy fans. Mm -hmm. Like occasionally, like, like sci-fi fans will hate fantasy or, or other way around. Um, I never like dislike fantasy or Jesus, I never dislike <laughs> sci-fi at all, but uh, but it wasn't really never like my first go to. I read like this what I would call like a lot of like soft fantasy or uh, and, and sci fi, like all the Asimov stuff and I know all that stuff when I was a kid. Um, then I mainly switched over to poetry for like a long, long time. And then I got I always kinda of dabbled still in fantasy and then I've been reading that a lot more lately. So Yeah, my I husband who does sci fi still refers to writing fantasy as like committing fantasy and so yeah they're they're, they're interesting yeah. things between the, the genres that, that <laughs> go on so we're not privy to all of them we yeah. just hear stories okay. do you see yourself as, as you know you're talking about you've been writing more fantasy lately but but i know you have what, what six books of poetry or how many yeah, they've sold dozens of copies. <laughs> <laughs> really, really impressive. No. Um, so, do you see yourself as changing to a, a fantasy writer, a po more of a prose writer than a poetry writer? I think both. I'm doing both. You're going to just take Because I, I don't necessarily, I have noticed that I never do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. if I switch gears to doing fantasy, then that's what I'm doing. And I'll do that like hours and hours every day, and I, I won't write a poem for. You know, weeks or a couple months or something, and then when I switch back to poetry, then I suddenly I don't have any interest in writing 
fantasy, but I'll write a lot of little, mm -hmm. you know, script a lot of little poems. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's just like, it depends on my mood, because mm -hmm. they both really bring a lot of, uh, I guess, joy to my life. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I had to say, I guess, joy to my life. <laughs> um, but writing them is just a different experience, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, there's this, uh, kind of an immediacy to being able able to, like, write a poem about something cool that you see or think about experience right away. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's obviously a lot of fun being able to sit down and write a, work on a novel. Mm -hmm. Okay, you had mentioned that you just got into outlining. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I don't know the names. Um, He's Michael. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm Teresa. Unless you want to you call him Teresa and me, Michael. I kind of feel like a Teresa today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, I can be Michael now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Michael mentioned that you just got into outlining. Do you outline? Or do you just sit down and type? Like, he said, mentioned that he does outline. Oh, he does outline. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I so. tend to... Oh, I tend to do sort of... Um, a, a very loose outline that's that's an overall picture of where I kind of see things going, um, but that's that's a number of pages. So I guess it could almost be I don't know if I'm going to say like a, a glorified synopsis, but I do I do a lot of writing out, and then I have to go in and really enhance things and figure out where I want to put in scenes. Um, and my husband does something that's even more intensive and he does a lot of world building and like well he's one of those people with sci-fi at least like he'll he'll be the type who's like doing his own like little world encyclopedia before he goes into a project and setting up all of the rules and like the uh oh the the geography of 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 the place so yeah, so I do some form of outline, but I know that there are just so many different ways that you can put together a novel, but I also know people who just, you know, they just kind of start and just sort of keep going. Yeah. And then, kind of like we were talking about National yeah. Writer, no, Novel Writers yeah. Month, you just write until you get to the end. Yeah. And then, an oh, well, of the month, and then you go back and you see what you have. And it's a way of generating things and... Things are the the benefit of doing that is that things are always changing as you keep writing, and so if you don't if you don't know quite where it's going to go, but you like revise the first three chapters forever, then you you know like you're ten years down the road and you have three chapters. Um, so I'm big, a big advocate of, advocate of just going and doing it and seeing what you find out along the way and who you have. Yeah. So, yeah, but there are so many ways of doing it. I would say that that. Of just kind of spinning my wheels is what kept me from, I guess, progressing uh, in terms of the overall story for a long time. I think I was getting better as a writer, but I was like, I felt like the story was getting nowhere because, yeah, I'd write like three chapters, like, eh, I don't like this passage in chapter two, I'm gonna go back and rewrite it. Well, now this is better than chapter one, I better start over. You know, as opposed to the other idea, which is just don't worry about it, just keep mm -hmm. writing. You change a character's name, fine, keep writing, whatever. You can always go back, do a control F, and change everything mm -hmm. later. Because uh, if you don't stop, depending on your style, but if you don't stop, you just push all the way through, um, you can always polish it later. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did, it's Laura, right? Mm -hmm. How did, because did you mention that that was like your alter ego? Or you wanted, you were oh, just thinking yeah. joking about yeah. it? Yeah, well, like, when, yeah. Well, like, how did that come up? Like, how did that come about? Oh, gosh, that she became a part ego. There was just, I don't know, something about her that I decided to put her in different situations and sort of say, okay, so what would I do in this situation if I really didn't give a crap about what people thought of me. I just kind of did what I felt was right or what I thought was most interesting to do in that particular situation. And so um, a lot of writers have characters that are, say, you know, they're polar opposite or they have something in common with, with them, be it, you know, polar opposite or something, or an alter ego or me from some other dimension. So maybe she is me from some other dimension where I, I'm a little bit less, like, socially conscious in terms of, like, what people think of me and that, that whole, like, gee, what would people think of me uh, if I did such and such? Like, that radio has just been totally shut off. 
Um, and and I just and uh, yeah, and I would just do whatever I felt like I wanted to do that at, at that point, like wear halos all over creation, which would be you know pretty fun. So um, yeah, sort of um, Teresa unplugged. Uh, <laughs> did, no, my husband called Larissa once um, distilled essence of Teresa was what he called her. So yeah, yeah, but there's there's a certain way of thinking about things that that we have in common. So, yeah, she's definitely the character that's closest to me of any character that I've ever written. Yep. Uh, does your husband, like, has your husband published any books? He has, he's still working on novels. He has not published a novel. He's published in, like, sci-fi magazines. So, with short stories. Mm -hmm. You guys are all really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to randomly say that. You can see where you got a picture of them. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. So many pictures. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I have no more questions. Thank you for coming. And I just have one. I just have one request, and that's that if the people who were in the class that chose the Whirling Prize and also their <laughs> professor, okay, Dan. If, if you could just wait so that I could snap a photo of you all. I, I really appreciate that. The rest of you see?